Today I have Brian Lanier's from Home Run Resources. Brian, Brazil and the United States. What's happening? Um, it's a pretty good chess match. Uh, on, on one side, you have a fairly aggressive player. On the other side, I think you have uh, a very strategic player. And, and what I mean by that, if you look at the history of that individual, President of Brazil, Lula, uh, his history is... Uh, his career history is as a negotiator. Uh, he was a union negotiator for the auto unions in Brazil under the dictatorship. I, I think you can understand in that scenario uh, how delicate you need to be uh, in how you progress your position. Um, obviously, anyone uh, that's leading the world in economic power and military power can be more aggressive in their stance. I think ultimately it goes neutral, if you ask me, because I think Brazil is far too important in, in the critical material supply space outside of China for America to not look at it and embrace it as a strategic supply center relative to what Brazil offers, but also relative to where Brazil sits, which is you know just south, if you look at the way uh, the countries line up, just south of the U.S. border. So... I see a long-term relationship that looks more like the historical relationship. Uh, and unfortunately, the United States has kind of ignored Latin America for a couple of decades. China's moved into that void. Uh, but I think both the EU and the United States need to uh, rekindle those relationships. Uh, if you look at Trump's strategy, it's usually spank and then and, and then get what you really want. Um, and, and, and I think we'll see that uh, in, in conjunction with how Brazil and the United States are, are negotiating their new relationship. I started this interview with this question because home run is a front run play, front runner play in Brazil. And speaking of that, you have been lining up your formation for shareholders and taking this to the next level. Can you give us an update? Yeah, I mean, we've been in the planning process for the better part of two and a half years. Um, you know, all these things start with an idea. Uh, there was three key figures in that idea. Uh, we went out and put the team together, put the assets together. Um, we're moving through that planning phase uh, to put that into material context. You know, we're in our sort of BFS phase. Uh, when those BFSs are done, uh, and there's effectively two of them uh, in process, but when those are done, then we'll have like that third party validation of the business model. Um, and, and, and if you look at the mining industry in particular, that's the moment of transition where you go from, oh, you're just another company that's not in production to, oh, you're a company that looks like you're headed to production. And so from that perspective, I think that's a huge milestone from a valuation perspective. And, and also, Tracy, that's why we're actually starting to get a lot of attention from sophisticated institutional high net worth and family office investors because they recognize where we are in that evolutionary process. If you're looking at a Lazan curve, you know, we've had that euphoric retail. We're now through that planning phase and we'll go into that development phase, which is pre cash flow. Uh, and that's where you get really the biggest bang for your buck relative to investing now and reaping your reward uh, on the other side of cash flow. You mentioned in the investor talk this morning that you're headed towards revenue on several fronts. Can you tell investors a little bit more about that? Yeah, we put together a diversified business model relative to our core competency, which is that silica. So in that aspect, uh, we're we're in we're in we're capable of production right now relative to our uh, industrial grade silica. We have business development going on in that area. We're delivering. It's a cycle, Tracy. It's sort of like you deliver a first sample and then you deliver a larger second sample and then you deliver a big bulk sample and then you work towards a customer, right? A lot of those things don't go very far relative to the economics of the relationship. They're too far away. They want a lower price, et cetera, et cetera. But some of those things we're working through that pipeline. That's pretty standard in the industrial material space. Uh, we're close to uh, the end CapEx, sort of the BFS on our high purity uh, processing plant. Uh, once we have that, we'll build that next year uh, and get into production on that. Uh, on our energy solution side, um, we're very close to revenue, should have revenue early part of next year, latter part of this year relative to 
uh, the sort of far end of the vertical. Uh, and we're in the licensing and commercialization stage relative to our energy storage side that we're working on with uh, the U.S. Department of Energy. So firing on all four cylinders across that sil silica competitive advantage. And speaking of competitive advantage, you're doing something that I thought was rather unique and competitive, which is listing on the London Stock Exchange. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, my history is to focus on disruption. I, I come from a tech background. Um, if, if and, and you need to do that across your business model. So we're in a traditional industrial vertical integration model, something that you can do in Brazil, you can do in China, you can do in India. You probably can't do it very well in the developed world because your OPEX, CAPEX, and the raw materials aren't there. Um, but what what we're doing is is we're we're developing out a company that's quite unique. Uh, relative to sort of what you usually see in, in our competitive space, which is like a single commodity company focused on moving to a resource, moving to a BFS, moving to a producing uh, entity. So we're quite excited relative to the opportunities that exist across the portfolio that we've built. Uh, and, and we're very close, like I said in the previous question, we're very close, you know, it, it, within 24 months of pulling cash flow out of all of those those various verticals. You were mentioning how solar is king and how silica is the second most used commodity in the world. Can you try and integrate those two facts together for our audience and how Home Run really benefits from that information? Solar is silica or silica is solar. So if you break down a solar panel, it has two main pieces, the glass, uh, and the silicon. Silicon is produced from silica and the glass is produced from silica. So if you remove silica from a solar panel, you have a little jumble of, 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 of materials that would have zero function. Um, so ultimately solar is dependent on silica. It's dependent on very high quality silica, both for the solar glass, unique silica, and also for the polysilicon that goes into it, unique silica. So solar is completely dependent on silica. We have to thank our friends in China for perfecting and commoditizing solar. Uh, but the reality is we're sitting on an extremely unique uh, silica uh, from the perspective of the solar glass. Uh, we're, we're not focused on uh, the silicon component of solar. We're focused on the solar glass component of solar, which is good for us because that's actually, that's actually the only uh, sort of a flat line price point over the last decade in, in the solar space uh, because everything else other than silver has gotten much cheaper over that timeline, but the solar glass has maintained its price. You just signed an LOI for additional mineral rights. Can you explain what the strategy was with this? Yeah, since the beginning, Tracy, we've been working on consolidating uh, strategic control over this resource. This resource is large and extremely unique. Um, and, and to put that into, you know, sort of traditional resource terms, if, if you have a copper asset and you have a concession and that asset exists outside your concession, you're going to spend a lot of your early time before you really show what you have in consolidating that district so that you control as much of it as possible. And in Latin America, you need to kind of get the land that's over top of that. There's a there's a there's a two ownership uh, situation in Latin America. Uh, relative to resource development. So all we've been doing is a traditional model of get as much of the asset, whatever you don't directly control, you want to control through partnerships. So that's how we've done it. We've acquired three assets in the district and we have partnership with two, the two other players in the district. One is a development partnership from a processing perspective uh, and the other is a supply relationship. Brian, I just want to take you back to the advantages of being in Brazil. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, we, we've been really lucky, Tracy, to focus. And, and, and this was done on purpose, but we, we, we've received a, a tremendous amount of support uh, from the government in Brazil. Um, if people are familiar with what's going on in Brazil in the last few years, the focus for reindustrialization comes like most countries around the world, they've deindustrialized over the last couple of decades where those industries went to China. Uh, they're really a raw material and agricultural supplier to the world. Uh, but the current administration wants to rebuild that industrial and they want to rebuild it around clean energy and the energy transition. So they're, they're not just saying that, they're actually putting capital into that. 
Um, there was a recent uh, development bank. Brazil has the second largest development bank in the world. And that, that recently, that development bank uh, did what's called a call where companies submitted applications relative to being approved for funding. Uh, we were in that call. And it was interesting in the feedback working with those committees relative to BNDS, which is the, the, the funding entity, uh, it, it was the, the feedback was always the same, which is, yeah, we have like these boxes that are supposed to be ticked relative to these applications, but Home Run's the only one that ticked every box. And, and the reason why is because we're from the start, we have been building a vertically integrated uh, energy transition company based on silica. And, and, and that's exactly what Brazil's mandate is, which is to take these critical materials that Brazil has, they have a buffet of them, and to advance those into refining and industrial purpose in Brazil. And that's exactly what we are doing and what we've done since day one. So that's been picked up. It's been picked up in the media. We've been on the national news. We've been on regional news. We've been on local news. We're working with uh, with political uh, bodies uh, at, at, the, at the regional level, uh, at the state level, and now at the federal level. Uh, we were recently involved in a dialogue with the new division of the Ministry in Mines, which is focused on exactly this, uh, expanding Brazil's capabilities through its raw materials and energy transition. Uh, and we were brought in as one of five companies to help dialogue with them so that they could facilitate that better for those five companies. So it was sort of like going to a restaurant without a menu and asking for what you wanted. Um, and and, and the, the, the dialogue's very open. The capital is available. Uh, they're deploying that capital. Uh, and, and we will be a recipient of that capital in this process. Uh, and that's all to the benefit of Brazil. Uh, it's, it's to the benefit of the local people. Uh, it's a benefit of uh, tax revenue. Uh, and we have a clean uh, business model, an ESG-focused clean business model, uh, which means we have a respect for the environment as well. Uh, and we've allocated a portion of our proceeds from this business model uh, to go into education. And obviously, that's a huge need in Brazil. It's the biggest need in Brazil uh, for it to, it to move from where it is today to being a more developed country. Speaking of your ESG and your competitive advantages, you were talking about antimony in solar panels and what makes Home Run so competitive. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, we're price competitive with Chinese uh, product, but we're also going to be uh, trend competitive relative to what's going on in solar glass. Uh, people are, are probably not familiar with what's going on, which is if you recycle a solar panel, uh, the product that you're getting no economics on is the solar glass. And the reason why is because 95 plus percent of solar glass around the world is made in China. Uh, China uses antimony because they use uh, lower uh, quality silica. In other words, it has high metal content. In particular, it has high iron content. Uh, that iron content, you can you can neuter the effect of that relative to how it affects the efficiency of a solar panel by putting antimony into the recipe. Uh, they use a fair bit of that. So all of that antimony is now sitting in a recycled solar glass pile. And if you go to any solar module recycler, you will see they have a big pile of glass sitting in the corner. And the only purpose for that glass is road fill. Um, and so from that perspective, our uh, silica, our silica that we have in Brazil is incredibly low iron content. When you wash it um, and sort it, you get down to below 10 ppm. China's hurdle rate is 120 ppm, and we're below 10 with literally no processing. And that goes directly into a solar glass furnace. Obviously, that reduces our costs because we don't have to buy antimony. Uh, if you want to put that into a real number, that's probably $30 million a year. Uh, and cost the goods sold that we don't have to spend. Um, and so it creates better economics. But on the other end of that, we're now in a regulatory transition, in particular in Europe and the United States, where they're now frowning from a regulatory perspective on Chinese solar glass or any solar glass that enters those jurisdictions that has antimony in it. I think that trend will close off. I think sometime in the next five years, there will be uh, no antimony solar glass, uh, that product will either get a premium in the marketplace or it will 
uh, leapfrog and, and take over the industry. Either way, we benefit. And we have a massive resource in Brazil of that low impurity uh, silica, low iron silica. So we'll be around for a couple of hundred years uh, at, at the highest levels of, of production, uh, producing solar glass into the future. Well, Brian, as always, it is such a pleasure. And for those of you wanting to find out more information, please go to the following website. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy.